In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My brothers and sisters, my family in Christ, how did your daily devotions go this week? How many times each day did you throw every distraction to the side for five, 15, or 30 minutes to walk with God in prayer? When you were walking with God in the Bible study and devotions and intentional prayer time that you set aside each day this past week, did you remember to pray for others just like Jesus taught us to do when he taught us to pray? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Did you pray for all the people of Iraq, along with our Christian brothers and sisters who are being persecuted and murdered for their faith? Did you also pray for the people who are being forced to flee, who are not in alignment with ISIS, who are not Christian? Did you and I pray for those claiming allegiance to ISIS and to Islam? Did you pray for those suffering the Ebola outbreak in West Africa? Did you pray for Ferguson, Missouri? Did you pray for those neighbors down your street? How did we pray for those who would harm others or those who anger us? Did we pray the same prayer of divine justice against ourselves that we prayed against those who anger us? Did we pray for that same justice of God against ourselves? Maybe you're like me, when you wished harm on that driver who cut you off in traffic, or that neighbor who frustrates you, or perhaps that fellow church member you just don't agree with. That other human being that Jesus died for, who just won't do things the way that you know to be the right way, to do things in their home, in their cubicle at work, in their church behavior, or wherever else you found yourself frustrated with somebody else, angry with someone else. When we pray for God's justice on those who are hell-bent on harming other human beings and other pieces of God's creation, are we also, and more importantly, praying that they come to a saving faith by God's grace? by God's Holy Spirit, miraculously working to save them, despite themselves, just as God does for each of us every single day, despite our own sinful nature. Walking with God is not some U.S. pre-World War I isolationist exercise where we try to mind our own business, fight the good fight of keeping the big bad world off of our property so it won't pollute us. Out of our circle of value as we've designed it to fit our preference of family as we've defined it. Walking with God is to hear and apply what he says to us for our sake. But not just for the sake of me and my own. What God declares, what God promises is and always has been for every nation, every tribe, every tongue in this whole wide world as God defines it, not as we define it. As God's forgiven children, may we pay heed, listen, and remember what God teaches us in his holy, holy word this morning. Because here, and only here, in God's spoken, written, taking on flesh to die for us and rise from the dead, that is the only place anyone has hope that will never die. Isaiah 56 begins with these two verses. God says, Thus says the Lord, Keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness will be, will be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Chapter 56 of Isaiah is a call to respond to God's undeserved mercy and goodness that was just poured out in Isaiah 55. And we know it was ultimately poured out for all people in Jesus Christ. We as Christians are to respond to undeserved mercy and goodness from God in the same manner towards the world. Undeserved mercy and goodness, period. No man-made conditions. 
No snide comments or whatever it is we might think of as a comeback when we suddenly become great lawyers finding the loophole of why we've got a special understanding with God and some of the rules don't apply to us. Does this mercy, this undeserved mercy and goodness from God, does it impact how we pray for our neighbors, all of our neighbors, especially the ones who are hell-bent on harming others? We, those God has redeemed by his gracious will, we forgiven sinners, we find happiness in doing what is right toward our fellow man. This is righteousness. This is being right with God. Earthly consequences? Absolutely. But let's not kid ourselves, folks. Dealing out earthly consequences through our human judicial system, it's not hard for us sinful human beings to figure out what is foreign to us, what is really, really hard, in fact, it's impossible for us on our own, is to love, is to respond to every situation with mercy, undeserved mercy, and goodness. We don't lash out demanding justice, retribution, fire and brimstone. We pray for justice. But if we demand that these things happen now, we are declaring that we are I am, that we know better than God about the right time for all things to be resolved. Walking with God is to constantly battle our egocentric, self-centered, ethnocentric way of thinking. This life is not about me. This life is not about just me and my own as I've defined it. The prophet Isaiah continues in verses 6 and 8 with God's word. And the foreigners, Gentiles, us, and we all say, phew, here's God's promise that we're going to be saved as well. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, the Lord God who gathers the outcast of Israel declares, I will gather yet others, foreigners, Gentiles, parentheses, I put that in there, to him besides those who already gathered. When we shut out God's life-giving word, we are left to labor for that which does not satisfy. Even if every single tragedy up to this very moment in history met its justice in terms of earthly consequences, there would already be a piling on of more unresolved and unjust tragedies before the end of my next sentence in this sermon. When we walk with God in prayer, with him in his word of promise in these verses, God calms us down and says, like he says in Psalm 46, be still and know, I am God. I've got this. The worship of all people, every nation, tribe, and tongue, it's not just some theme of the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament promises. It has been God's constant promise and reassurance to us as his people throughout all of the history of creation. God declares again and again and again that he will send the Messiah to rescue you. He'll crush sin, your sin, the devil, and the grave. God will send him again to make all things new. And until then, he commands us, he calls us, he graciously invites us to walk with him, to love our neighbor, to pray for them, to reach out to them, walk with them, suffer with them, grieve with them, and share with them the only hope that anyone can have in this whole wide world, regardless of the century or present circumstance. God declares again and again, he's got this. He doesn't need us to be the backseat driver or an employee being a Monday morning quarterback to the CEO of a company or a middle school or a high school age child telling a parent what they want to do on the weekend. God reassures us in this book of Isaiah chapter 56 that he's going to make all things new. And while we are in this chaotic mess of billions of heartbreaks on a daily basis, we are to walk with God in prayer. Remember the bottom line, that all of this stuff boils down to the first commandment. God is God and I am not. All the stuff of this world boils down to the two greatest commandments. First, love God. That means we trust him, especially when he and everything around us is not making any sense at all. 
if it doesn't make sense to us, doesn't that indicate that we need help, that we need deliverance from outside of ourselves to make all things right, all things new? Second, love others. No, really, without the snide comments, without the gossiping thoughts. Do you know that gossip, unkind words or thoughts, there is much murder to God as a rocket being fired from Palestine into Israel or from Israel into Palestine? May we listen to Jesus. Let's work on the plank in our own eye rather than the speck in somebody else's. And when we help them with the speck in theirs, may we do it with undeserved mercy and grace without demanding our version of justice is the right one that God should listen to. God is judge. God will provide earthly and tragically even more serious consequences to those who are hell-bent on harming others. But that's God's business. That's not ours. The task, the calling that God has given us after forgiving us when we were his enemies, God has given us the mission of loving others, responding to God's undeserved mercy and goodness by pouring out on others undeserved mercy and grace. That begins with prayer praying for them, praying with them, walking with them, loving them as Christ first loved us, period. No additional human conditions that we might think of. It all boils down to this. Jesus died on the cross to forgive the sins of the whole wide world. He rose from the dead to promise and reassure on a daily basis that sin, devil, and death are defeated once and for all. If Jesus overcame these Certainly the tragedies and unjust chaos all around us and most of all within us in our own sinful nature is overcome through Jesus Christ alone. We sing this song to our children. My God is so great, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do for me, for you. Do we believe this? Of course we do. Otherwise we wouldn't teach it to our children. So may we apply this glorious truth to the mindset, the heart set, the lifestyle set on God to walk with him, disregarding and throwing away our own ideas of how things should be, how our neighbor should be, our version of justice, our version of making things right to ourselves, and instead pay heed, remember, and share God's goodness, God's mercy in Jesus Christ, his making us righteous by the blood of the one and only hope, given for the whole wide world, Jesus Christ. The victor over every terrible thing from the fall in Eden, the first war when Cain murdered his own brother Abel. Jesus Christ is the victor over every terrible thing from then through this present age and every century to come before the resurrection. The cross was enough. That's why Jesus said it is finished. The empty tomb was the glorious end of all things that would fight against God Almighty. God Almighty promises that he will make all things new. In the meantime, we walk with God and we walk with our neighbor, right next to them, no distance between them and ourselves, just as God came near to us, so we draw near to others, not driven by fear or guilt, but driven by that same reconciliation and mercy that God shared with us, we share with them to love them as God in Christ first loved us, for God's glory, for the sake of all people in the world to be rescued by God. This is why we pray, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. I know I got emotional during my sermon. It's because I believe it. I believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. I believe that no matter how awful this past week was in the world, Jesus is going to make all things new. So please know, that's why I'm emotional. I'm not trying to tug on your heartstrings. I'm not trying to do some pietist guilt trip or anything like that. This is the truth. This is what we lean on. So pray, walk with God, and walk with others. I love you. I hope that you're blessed by God's word. And anything I did to distract you, just let it be out of the way. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and our minds on Christ Jesus until life everlasting.
Amen.